I'm speaking on understanding the personal attributes of God, understanding the personal attributes of God. Uh, Reverend To, when he was here, took us through the relational attributes of God. Uh, those are the attributes which God have and which he can share with all of us. But today, I want to look specifically on the, uh, the personal attributes of God. What are these attributes? These are attributes which uh, define the essence of God, which make God God. Uh, you know, you can have mercy like God, you can have love and have the relational attributes of God, but those does not make you God, all right? Uh, now that you love so much, it doesn't make you God. So, but there are things which make God God. And uh, these are the personal attributes of God. Uh, so God's attributes, uh, God's personal attributes are those attributes uh, that define the essence of who he is. These are the attributes which define the essence of who he is, who God is. You know, uh, God's attributes reflect his very being, they, they, they show us who he is. Uh, you know, uh, your being defines uh, who you are, and these attributes define who God is. Uh, these attributes are not acquired or uh, simply ascribed to him. Uh, you see, uh, we, we, we are, it's not that we are so fascinated about this God, and so we begin to ascribe some attributes to him, which are so good, and we say these ones are only for you. No, uh, these attributes which God have, personal attributes of God, they are never acquired, and uh, we don't ascribe them uh, to him. He, he, is, he, has the, he has those particular uh, qualities. Actually, it defines the essence of who he is. Um, you know, when we say that God is love, we do not mean that God at, at some point uh, in the course of his existence acquired love, you know? You know, that is who he is. Uh, God does not have love. God himself is love. And so there is no place whereby we can say that at one time the love of God has gone cold or the love of God has diminished. So it defines his existence. Um, um, you know, so when we say God is love, it means that that is who he is. He doesn't have love. He is the very love we're talking about. Um, the second thing when we are talking about God's personal attributes, we are talking about uh, these attributes being absolute and unchanging, you know. Uh, he does not have them today, tomorrow, uh, uh, and don't have them tomorrow. So these personal attributes of God are absolute and they are unchanging. They are not subjective in any way. You know, they, they don't keep changing from time to time. Uh, his attributes are his nature and therefore cannot change. They cannot become better or worse uh, because God is a perfect being. Uh, Jehovah, uh, and that is the God we're talking about here, you know, he is perfect. He is, is perfect in all his being, and uh, he cannot change. He is so predictable. We can know him. We can know his ways. You know, he does not change. The Bible says there is no turning of shadows with him. You know, that is our God. He is perfect. He's complete and is absolute. Yeah, so when we're talking about these attributes, we are talking of things which does not change. We are talking of things which uh, are absolute. They are in God and they make him God and that defines his nature. Now, uh, for us to understand this, uh, I just want to pull from the scriptures uh, some uh, some of the things which God himself said. Uh, you know, we want to pull from the scriptures, uh, uh, what are these uh, attributes, what are these personal attributes we have in God? 
And that way we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25 to verses 27. That's going to be our scripture reading. Yeah, so um, in that scripture, you know, uh, what we find there, God says, uh, I'm looking for an equal mate. I'm looking for someone who can be my equal, all right? Uh, do you have someone who can be the equal of God? Do you know anyone who can be his equal? Okay, now let's look at this. God has got no equal. God has got no equal at all. Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 25. Now, he begins by saying, To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Uh, says the Holy One. Uh, to whom will you compare me? Or to who, or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Now, this is the message of God to the children of Israel. At a time when the Israelites were faltering, you know, into worshiping other idols, uh, lifting up other gods, you know, going into other worship, making for themselves idols of stone, of wood. And uh, they would make in Isaiah, the very chapter, you know, uh, God talks about how foolish it is that a man would get a wood, chop the wood, Part of the uh, pieces from the wood, it takes them and throws them into the fire and lights and cooks food with it. And then the remaining part, uh, the same person puts it on a pedestal and says, you are my God. And now you begin to worship. Now, God was really mocking the Israelites. He was mocking and telling them, how foolish are you that you can just make a piece of wood and say, this is my God. And so, um, so that way God was telling the Israelites, you people don't have reason at all. And so it comes through Isaiah and he tells them, now to whom will you compare me? You know, some of the things, you know, God was looking at their nonsense and he was wondering, you know, they don't have any reasoning at all. And so God asks them a question, to whom will you compare me? And then God answers, asks again, who is my equal? All right? Who is my comrade? Who is that person who stands and sits on my class? Who is that person who can bring me competition? And so God says, who is my equal? Can we say amen? I know many of us have some people who are the equal of God. Can you bring that person on? You know, in Western Kenya, we have the bullfighters. Do you have a bull equal my bull? All right. <laughs> Actually, that's what God was saying. Do you have a bull equal me? If you have a bull equal my size, bring him on. Let's go to the theater and see. And so some of us have really lost the touch of God. Until we are equating God to a little girlfriend who has some size figure eight or size eight. Hmm? You are equating God with your husband who has, what is that called, the figure for the men? Six pack or eight pack. Now you think, now oh God, you know, I have, you know, Pastor, you don't know my husband, I tell you, he's the best man. Why are you equating God with some people? And so God says, bring him on. If you think it's my size, bring him. Bring him on. <laughs> All right? And so that is what God is telling the Israelites. Who is my equal? Who, who can stand? You know, we can stand and compare. And unfortunately, truly, you know, many of us have other things. We've lifted up for ourselves gods and idols. We put our trust and faith and confidence in things which when God looks at them, you know, the, to say the least, they are just but foolishness. So God begins by saying, to whom will you compare me, Sita Meldoret? 
to you will you compare God with? And then God says, who is my equal? I really like that. Who is my equal? Do you have someone who is, can stand and, and, and compete with me in anything? Do you have someone who is smarter than me? Do we have someone who is wiser than me? Do we have someone who is stronger than me? And so God pulls a challenge. And he says now in verses 26, he pulls a challenge. And he says if you want to just, if you want to grasp who I am a little bit, just a little bit of who I am, he takes them to verses 26, all right? Now let's try to see the challenge which God brings in verses 26. He says this, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Look to the heavens. So God is saying, uh, if you want to try, to, if you, for you to be able to be able to know who, uh, who I am, just go out there. Go out there. And he says, when you get out there, lift your eyes and look up into the heavens. Look into the sky. All right? Uh, you know, unfortunately, our eyes are, are limited. We, we don't see everything. And thank God, God gave us, uh, you know, ability to create things. We created the powerful telescope uh, and the one which has been running in the space for some time now. Uh, over 20, about 20 something years, uh, that is the Hubble telescope, has done an amazing work, you know, to show us what's up there in the heavens. And last December, you know, uh, our, our, uh, you know uh, the, 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 uh, our astronomers uh, did send the latest uh, telescope to go to the, to the space. What is the name of the telescope? All right. You are farmers, you only know what type of seed to plant. You know what 18 for 6 and all the others. Now, the latest telescope really that was launched just the other day is called the James Webb Telescope. Uh, I've been following that for some time. Since 2018, they've been trying to send it, postponing it until they did it last December. Now, the James Webb is the latest, uh, you know, technology. It's the latest uh, ingenuity of, of humanity. And so it's up there and it's very powerful, much stronger than the Hubble telescope. And now God is saying, you guys, get the James Webb. Take it out there to the space and look up into the heavens. Are we together? Go and see what's out there in the sky. And see, and, and, and see to what God says. And God puts a question and says with your powerful telescope, can you see what you're seeing? And you know when you see with a telescope, what do you see there? You know, massive, massive stars, you know. They are in their billions. Not only are they stars, they are planets. They are, uh, what are these, uh, uh, the galaxies. There are so many, there are so, so many. In fact, just a size of a pin, when it's just focused by the telescope, you know what we are able to see is billions of galaxies, billions of stars. And that's so interesting. I said in the first service, you remember the story of Abraham when he called, God called him and gave him the promise. He told him his children will be as many as? And as? The sun. Actually, God says that the stars and the sun are many. But let me ask you, when you get out there, you see how many stars. Are they as many as the sun? Surely, you don't see everything. And God, you know, you know, God knows what we don't know. And he's just telling them, actually, before we had the Hubble telescope, before we had the James Webb, he's telling them, you guys have not seen everything up there. The stars are many. They are as many as the sand. 
But now in these few years, our good scientists are boasting and we say, man, we've conquered the world. We now know everything out there. You are just coming too late. God said this many years to Abraham. The sand as, you know, the stars are as many as the sand. Are you listening to me? So God says, look up into the sky. Who made all this? Amazing. Who made all these things here? And then God continues to say, he who brings out the starry host one by one. He says, man, it's me. It's me. You don't know the person, but it is. It's me. And he says, I bring them, I bring out the starry hosts one by one. And you see, he has done how many times? Not ten times, not a million times. Billions of times. Are you able to redo that? So he's just saying, bring that compare. Just say one person who can look up into the sky, see the massive things I've created, and then who is that person who can bring one by one? And look at the next sentence. Not only does he call and does he bring them out one by one, he also calls them by name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the King of Kings a little bit there. He calls each star by name. You know, our scientists have given us a number of some stars around our neighborhood. Uh, and we have, of course, our star, what is, which is the sun, the one which we see up here. And we have other stars within our Milky Way galaxy. You know, that is where we live, uh, our, the Milky Way galaxy. And not only do we live within the Milky Way galaxy, we live in can, a small place or a planet called Earth, which actually, it cannot be seen by anything. You know, where we live, the Earth, you cannot go out there and say, oh man, let me see home. You can't see home. The Earth is too Tiny, it is as tiny as nothing. Really? This earth is too small. It, in fact, actually, it's as, it is as if it does not exist. If this art today, actually, and it will, if this art is destroyed, do you know even the other galaxies will not know something happened? Sure, they will think nothing has happened. Everything is still the same. And so God brings a challenge and he says, hey, I know all the stars, the galaxies, the billions of them, and he says he calls them all by name. Amazing. You know, we are only 8 billion. Do you think the stars are 8 billion? No. They are billions and billions and billions without end. And so God says, I know each one of them by name. We even don't have the vocabulary to name all of them. But he has the vocabulary. Listen, friends. If God knows the stars by name, do you think he doesn't know, he doesn't know Jane Jerry? Do you think he doesn't know Concepta or Rusoheba, your beautiful name? Can you say he knows my name? He knows my everything. That is Jehovah. And so, let's finish this. He says he calls each by name. And look at what he says, the reason why he's doing this. He's saying this is not a lazy man's business. This is not a weak person's business. And he says, if you have one of my equal, bring him on. And so let him put his statement there 
what he has achieved. And here he's saying, this is my achievement. And not all, it's just a little of my achievement. And God says, because of his great power and might and mighty strength, not one of them is missing, friends. Not one of them is missing. Hallelujah. Not one of them is missing, friends. Let's celebrate the Lord for that. He is not a lazy God. He is not a weak God. He says not one of them is missing. Can you tell your friend I'm also not missing? He's holding me together. You know, some of us think, you say, Pastor, you don't know my problems. And you even say, Pastor, you need to sit down before I tell you. <laughs> here with your eyes here, you can faint, Pastor. <laughs> oh, man, that is too small. <laughs> if he carries the entire universe, the galaxies, and all the planets, and everything that we see, he says, I do that because of my might. I do that because of my strength, and I do that because of my power. Now, he's talking about physical things. I'm not talking about spiritual strength here, brother. We're talking about the real dynamis. You know the real dynamis? The real energy as men you do. You see that? God is talking about this now. How much can you carry? You know the weightlifting? Or he said, leave alone carrying. Not even one of them is missing. I'm sustaining them. Now, let me bring you home a little bit. Our son, just the one that is close to us, the one that is making us come to Sunday service today. Our son is not the biggest I know at times we think we are even at the center of the world. Who told you? You are a nothing. You, you are a useless. Uh, sorry. You are just. <laughs> you are surviving by grace. <laughs> that is what I can say. At times we think we are at the center of the world. Who told you? Actually, out of imagination, because definitely there is no way we can go out of our galaxy to see ourselves. All right? Uh, but... It is imagined, it's imagined, we can only look at our galaxy by looking at the other galaxies which are across. We have one of them which is close to us, and it's about, is it 2.5 billion light years? You know, the speed that light travels in a year. Do you know that? You know, uh, the speed that light travels in a year, uh, you know the distance that it has covered? You know, speed, light is the fastest thing really known so far. So uh, our nearest could be some uh, billions, some 2 or 2.5 billion light years away. Now, we know, do you know what that means really? It means that star we're looking at, let's say that is about, uh, uh, let's say, let me bring it to another figure that we can understand. Let's say we say it's about 1,000 light years away. You know, an object that is 1,000 light years, it means that when light leaves that object and it comes to us, we will see it after 1,000 years. So we are seeing it as it was 2,000 years ago because light has been coming all these thousands of years just to reach us. So this world is massive. But now look at our star. Our sun. Do you know how many times our earth can fit the sun? You know, at times we think that this star is very small. Actually, the earth as it is can fit into the sun that you're looking at now 1.3 million times. You now take the earth, we create another one. We have two arts so that it may shamba to Toshi. We have two arts, three arts, four arts, a thousand arts, but we still have space. Continue. 
continue until you are done with 1,023 times. And this is now the small star. This is not the biggest. Eh? Now, God says, because of my great power and might, not one of them is missing. You know, when God was telling the Israelites these and, and Isaiah for that purpose, and Isaiah probably used to sing the song we always sing about the stars. What is the song concerning the stars, little? Can we go? Three stars? Okay. <laughs> now, let me tell you, friends, they are not twinkle, twinkle, little. <laughs> Isaiah was like you. <laughs> so, when God says, I hold them in my hands, when you have that mentality, twinkle, twinkle, little stars, you think they are just holding things like flowers. Oh. Now, when God speaks, when he wants to reveal a bit of himself, you know, he will just tell us something which will take us many years for us to know this. You know, this thing, we didn't know that the things we see out there, they are not little, little, twinkle, stars. It's God himself who is revealing to Isaiah. And he tells man, you know, if you want to know how strong I am, look at the stars. They are not little, little tingle stars. It's now that we understand that the stars are massive. And then God is saying, it's because of my might and power. Not even one of them is missing. Oh, that is the God we serve. Now, there are two things that come out of this scripture. One, we find that we get an attribute of God. One is that God is all powerful. Can we say amen? amen. Is your God powerful? Yes. Very powerful? Yes. Can he carry you in his hand? Yes. He can carry the whole universe. He's carrying the whole world. So God is all powerful. The second thing we find here is that God is all knowing. He knows every star by name. And today, let me submit to you, friends. He knows you. He knows you. Pastor Kiprop doesn't know you, but he knows you. Our governor doesn't know you, but he... You cannot escape in his fingers. You know, some of us are saying, I'm so irrelevant, nobody knows me. He knows you. He knows you, friends. Do you know what? He knows what you eat. Do you also know what? He knows where you hide at night. You know the place where you go? When you look to the left and to the right? He knows there. He is on knowing. Now, I want to bring this to a close by looking at verses 27. These attributes of God brings questions at the same time. All right? There are questions that arise from the attributes of God. One, let's read verse 27. You know, God has just finished saying, uh, you know, look here. Uh, this is who I am. Look at my strength. And then in verse 27, God asks the question now. He poses a question to the children of Israel. And the same question is being posted to us. You know, God is saying, why do you say? You know, he said, okay, this is me, so powerful, all-knowing. And then he asked the question, then, why do you say? Why do you say, oh, Jacob, and complain, oh, Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. You know? Why do you think that I don't understand you? Why do you think that I'm not conversant with your ways? Why do you think that I don't understand your feelings? 
Why do you think that I don't know? So that's what God says. The second thing he asks is this. Or why do you think my cause is disregarded by my God? You know, what that comes out is that like very strong God, very powerful God, all-knowing God, but Israel and Jacob are coming out saying, as much you people sing in church and say, he knows everything, it seems he doesn't know my, he doesn't know my ways. As much as people you sing and say, God is so strong, he can do everything, it seems he's unable to do what I'm, go to handle what I'm going through. And so Jacob is saying, my cause is disregarded by my God. It's like God has left me. He's unable to carry me through. How many of us feel at times like that? Oh, these are the giants of faith. You only say and it becomes. You only pray once and you don't repeat again and tomorrow you have. You just say, be healed, and there you walk, healthy. You pray for your husband who was messing up with your family, and then tomorrow he just comes home smiling. You are just sick and you say, I am well, and there you are well. Your children don't give you problems at all. You find Johnny has gone out for Dunda, and you just say, I command you, Johnny. I arrest you, Johnny. And Johnny just stays home. Is that how you people be, live your lives? Now, do you, you say you people have all your answers, your prayers answered. My not all are answered, my friend. I'm struggling. You know, at times I ask myself, where is this God now, really? Eh? We, I speak at times like the Israelites. Now, please let me not say this too loud. You know how we were married with my wife. Do you know how many years we stayed without a child? Go and Google. At times you think God has forgotten you. And you just come like the Israelites. And then God is saying, I'm so powerful. And then you're just wondering, which God are you talking about? He cannot handle something in my house. Is he really powerful? How many of us are now in that category? <laughs> so, these attributes of God, you know, he says, I'm so powerful, I'm all-knowing. Then you wonder, really, I remember, for real, there is a day in my life, and I was in this city, and I'd been invited to preach in a church here in this town. And when I came to that service, it was a revival meeting, I was the greatest man of God on the poster. And so when I preached, 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 and Sunday came, and uh, I remember some people were giving testimonies. And they say, praise the Lord. God is good, brethren. God is good. Do you know what was really going on, real, in my heart? I was saying, these people are deceiving us. God is not good. And I'm also a preacher. Eh? But in my heart, due to the things I was going through, I was just saying, hey man, let's just be real. I doubt if he's good. How can a good God allow me to go through such things? How can a good God, how can a good God really have done nothing wrong? I am his servant. How can a good God allow me to go through such? But he was still good anyway. 
I remember I said that day, if you are really good, let me know. Can you prove yourself? Let me not tell you whether he proved or he did not. These attributes of God are brought questions. All right? Why would a powerful God not stop a catastrophe? All right? We were doing this lesson really in our ex -cans. And one of the question was, why would God not, if he's so powerful, why would he not stop some things? Why would he not stop some things? Now look at Adam and Eve. God is so powerful, but he's defeated by a young lady called Eve. If he's so strong, the hand in the hand would have just freezed and would not come back to the mouth because his God is so powerful. But look, not only that, he comes too late and he says, where are you? Is he all-knowing? Surely. He now wants to get some news. What have you done? He doesn't know. <laughs> All right, I know now I have crazy questions in your mind. <laughs> Please, let's leave that for another class. Okay? But I want to say this. As much as God is all-powerful, there are things which God cannot do. There are things which God cannot do. One of the things the Bible tells us, the Bible says God cannot, cannot lie. With all his power, he cannot. Why wouldn't he lie? Because God operates basing on two principles. And those are the two principles I want to lay as, a found, as an understanding. Psalms 97 verses 1 to 2, the Bible says, the Lord reigns, let the earth be glad. He's the sovereign God, he's so powerful. And so let the earth be glad. The earth be glad. Verses 2 says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Now listen to me. God operates on the foundation, on the platform of two things. One is righteousness, and the second is justice. And the word righteousness comes actually from the root word right. God cannot do anything out of rightness. He cannot. And that is where at times we think God does not work. We think God is powerless. Yes, he's powerless because he cannot do anything that's not right. James says you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss. And you ask because of your selfishness. You can pray and fast. You can do all the Pentecostal gymnastics. And after it all, heaven is still silent. God is only moved by what's right and what's just. Justice at times is not sweet. Justice at times is painful. All right? So God is not in the business of making us feel good. You say, now if I tell them this, atasikia vibaya. Mungu, don't have to scare you. He will give you the full dose. 
You think God is scared by your maximum tears. They always say it. Maximum what? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. If you are God, really, really, let the people know. Do you think God wants to prove himself? He knows he's God, so he has nothing to prove. You are struggling. So you are, don't try to, <laughs> yeah. you know, how we, we always massage the ego of some people. You say, hey, Arena, I see where we are. Can you prove you are a man? Tunakusaik, tunakusaik until you do something. You don't say God. You can't say him. Can we say amen? amen? Two things moves God. What's right and what is just. Regardless of your pain, he will act on those two words. Here, the Israelites are complaining to God because God has sent them into slavery. They are suffering. And now they think God has disregarded their ways. It's as if God has forgotten them. No. He's giving you, he's having you justice. Are you listening to me? You know, some of us, even if we come to pray to you, we can't change anything because you are being served. You are. Justice is being served. So we'll just tell you, finish your term. Because justice is being served. Quickly, uh, let me, let's look at these two things, justice and, justice and, please if you forget everything, don't forget these two things. The omnipotence of God, the all-powerful God works on these two rails. All right? So look at Abraham, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 18 and verses 19. Let's read there. <clears throat> now, I have chosen him, that is Abraham, so that he may direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. Now, God is saying, I called Abraham, I chose Abraham, and he says for this reason, that he may direct his household, that they may keep the way of, the way of who? The way of the Lord. Now, what is the way of the Lord according to this? Now, by doing what is right and what is, are you seeing the way of the Lord now? God walks on these two rails. He says, I raised Abraham so that he may train and teach his children the way of the Lord. And what is the way of the Lord? By doing what is right and what is justice and righteousness. Let's look at Jesus, the emphasis of Jesus, Matthew 23 and verse 23. All to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. All right, hypocrites, are hypocrites in the house? Can the hypocrites say amen? <laughs> All to you teachers of the law and Pharisees and hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices mint, dill, and cumin. But listen to this. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. All right? You have neglected the meat. What is the meat there? And? And? That is what matters here. It is justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Now let's come to the implication as I bring this to a close. Implication one. As much as God is all-powerful and all-knowing, he cannot act outside of rightness and justice. He cannot act outside of those. 
Have you not heard that God is no respecter of persons? Truly is, is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't respect persons, but he respects what's right and what's just. When God comes to make judgment, he does not look at the face. He looks at what's right and what's just. And so let's read Genesis 20, chapter 18, verse 25. This is one of my best scriptures. I read it again this morning, and it excited me. Wow. Now, let's read this. This is Abraham talking to God concerning his brother who? Lord, who was in the city of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, far be it from you to do such a thing. Now, God is telling God, no, Abraham is telling God, it's you told me, you raised me to teach people to do what's right and what is. And now he's saying, hey, God, hey, Apple, let me stop you now. Let me give you some piece of advice, God. Far be it to you that you do such a thing. To kill the righteous with the wicked. Treating the righteous and the wicked alike. You know what Abraham is telling God here? That's not justice. Treating the righteous and the wicked alike? Mm -mm, it can't be. And then he continues to tell God again, Far be it. Why is it? Why is it? God, nisi why? Nisi why? Far be it from you. And then he says what I like most. Will not the judge of all the universe, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Now he's telling God, really God, this, this, that you are defeated to separate the wicked and the righteous. That's how they would have everybody now, randomly. He's telling him, you don't know your position. You are the judge of all the earth. And he tells him, will the judge of all the earth now fail in this? That he doesn't know to do what's right? So that way, let me tell you, as much as God is all-powerful, he will always do the right thing. He cannot use his power to do anything that's not right. And he cannot be an accomplice in wickedness. You have your own wickedness, umejawana, and forgiveness, and every hour in the morning you say, I release fire to my enemies. Burn them, Lord, burn them, Lord. And you think you are, you want God to be an accomplice in such. In your bitterness. And you say, you've not seen anything yet, man. That man is still coming down. They will know that I'm a man of God. Nonsense. God, can, God cannot be an accomplice in wickedness. You are so full of wickedness and revenge and rage. And now you say, God is not answering me. He will not. <laughs> Implication two. That is to us now. God does what's right always. To us, God says this. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. Okay, are you seeing that now when it comes to us? I cannot stand your assemblies. Huh? God is now telling us, I hate. Hey. I hate, I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, you come and say, Lord, we come. We come into the house of the Lord with grain and, and burnt offerings. He says, I will not accept them. 
Though you bring your choice fellowship offering, I have no regard for them. Imagine. Now let's come to the next and last part. Can all of us say away? Away with the noise of your songs. God is tired. Please, please, please. Angels. Away with the noise of their songs. Hey. In fact, it has an exclamation. I don't know who put it there. Is it God or myself? <laughs> Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to, to, your, to your music. Worship team. Begin morning, friends. <laughs> God is saying, I will not listen to your music. Oh, and my good band. God is saying, even to you, dear powerful bass and you're doing all the things and you're God is like away I will not listen to them I will not listen to your music but what is God saying friends but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream that is the call of God for our lives Hallelujah. If you want to see the greatness of God, the power of God, he's not saying bring a wonderful dance to Rukaki Messiah. I know you're doing all this. Hey, they are good friends. Please don't stop. But God is saying, I will not listen. So it's not me who I said anyway. If you have any issue with it, ask him. Hmm? Ask him. But he's commanding us to do two. Justice and righteousness. In conclusion then, in conclusion then, what should we do? You know, God is really very concerned with this. As much as we are really laughing, God is concerned with this. How do we treat people? Are we just? Do we do what is right? What is our motivation? All right? How do we exercise power? Do we do what is right every time? Do we give out justice? Even emotionally. Some of us can deprive people Justice. Huh? You know, some of us are very hard. Until everybody in the room is very quiet. Do you think you are doing something better? You are depri depriving us fellowship and friendliness and love and kindness and goodness. And so God tells Cain these words in Genesis 7, chapter 4, verse 7. If you do what is, will you not be? God is no respecter of persons. You've been trying A, B, C, D, and all that. But God is telling you one thing. You don't need a prayer. What do you need? Do what is? If you do what's right, will you not be? Very simple. But if you do not do what's right, look at what is waiting. Sin. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Friends, God is calling us to the place of victory. We have to make the decision to do what's right and what is. And that way, God tells Cain, you have to master it. You have to master it. Let's stand on our feet. You know, God is calling us not to a religious duty, but he's calling us to the place of sobriety. You know, to look on issues which Jesus said they are the weighty matters, the real matters of life. 
and those are justice, and that is doing what's right. It's not about favoring people, it's about doing what's right always. God does what's right always. And what he does as justice at times may not be pleasant. Yes, but God cannot bend his rule, he cannot bend his way. But he tells Cain, if you do what's right, will you not be accepted? Let's bow down for a word of prayer. You are here and you're saying, Pastor, there are things in my life I need to make right. There are things in my life where I need to serve justice. Or there are some things you are going through in this life because God who is just cannot do anything because you are reaping what you sowed. But in the mercy of God, we want to pray that he may help us. What are we asking God? that he may grant us the grace to do what's right. There are things you want, you may need to go and ask for forgiveness. There are people you may need to forgive. There are things you have to do right for you to begin to experiencing the breakthroughs of God. You need such a prayer, kindly lift up your hand up as I make these final prayers. Thank you. Just lift it high. Thank you for those hands that are going up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for grace, Lord. The grace to do what's right. The grace to turn around the tide of darkness by doing what's right. The grace to do what's just so that we may turn away the heavy darkness on our lives in our relationships, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray for the grace and the button to do the right things, to say the right things, to think the right way, to do everything according to will. So Father, you know the hands that have been lifted concerning the issues they know. Father, we pray for your grace. Give them the power today to go out and do the right things. And by so doing, Lord, they will come back with joy and, and testimonies of your great interventions. Because you are the sovereign God and the most powerful God. Father, we thank you. Father, we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.